Morning, everybody. It's a, a great privilege and a great pleasure to be back in this beautiful and, as we just heard, very lucky country. Uh, unfortunately, today I'm going to prove two hoary old adages. The first one that POMs are much gloomier than Aussies, generally. <laughs> uh, and the second one that if you have two economists, you have three opinions. Uh, because I'm going to be arguing that really economics is deeply political and politics is deeply economic. They're both joined at the hip. And that unfortunately, from a big picture perspective, we really do have some things to be worried about, even if they don't all play out in 2017. Now, the title of my presentation today is The Great Game of Global Trade. You're obviously all very, very busy farmers. I do hope at some point in your lives you've had time to play these four games and you recognize them. Solitaire, Snakes and Ladders, Monopoly, and Risk. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about the impact of Donald Trump on global trade. Obviously, that's a moving target. If he tweets anything relevant that makes what I'm saying irrelevant, could somebody just put their hand up while I'm talking and let me know, and I'll try and change the presentation accordingly. Right, let's press on. Because trade is such a political issue and such a complex issue, I want to take a very big picture and historical approach to try and explain it to you. And the first thing I want to say is that in contemporary economics and politics, we see trade as this game, snakes and ladders. Now you say, why snakes and ladders? Well, because there's one clear rule, which is comparative advantage, which I'm sure you all basically remember from your boring economics classes when you were younger, that we should specialize where we have a comparative advantage. Now, some countries can go up the ladder of comparative advantage and others go down the ladder. For example, Thailand 50 years ago obviously had a strong agricultural base. Today, Thailand is also a huge exporter of automobiles. So they've shifted up the ladder of comparative advantage there whilst retaining their agricultural base at the same time. Other countries can move downwards. But if we all specialize where we have comparative advantage, output is maximized and we're all better off. So we're all better off by playing snakes and ladders. That's how we see it. The problem is trade, historically, if we look at the long run, and I'm talking about thousands of years of history, has not always been either free or fair. And if you look at the screens here, here's another set of views on global trade we might recognize from the past. Here are Europeans carving up the globe in various different ways, uh, tentacles spreading all over the place, European empires uh, in Asia and around the world, and of course, you know, US nefarious influence everywhere. Uh, and these particular views of trade have been around for a very, very long time, and they are re-emerging again at the moment, as I'm sure we're all aware. The important thing to recognize is that what they are all trying to say, these views, in one way or another, is that they don't like trade the way it's happening because it's being seen as monopoly. One particular country is monopolizing trade with another to the disadvantage of the country on the receiving end of it. So we say snakes and ladders. The populists, or those who are rejecting free trade, both in the past and at the present, are saying, no, no, it's monopoly. And in fact, in some countries, historically, this was the norm, and today you're hearing the same thing again, people are saying, we'd be better off playing solitaire, basically just trading internally as much as we can, uh, and really just trading at the margin with other countries, rather than looking to free trade as the answer to everything. And let me stick with history a little bit further. Growing up uh, in the UK in the 70s, I can actually remember seeing pictures like this in my textbooks at school to try and explain why some countries were rich and others were poor. Does anyone remember this vaguely? No? Yes, no? Basically, the country started off trying to guard their national treasure. They would try and export more than they imported to run that lovely trade surplus, build up their treasure balance. And they would do that by the mother country or the powerful country exporting high value added products to weaker countries in what we used to call the third world who would sell them raw materials back generally at low prices. This is still actually banging around as a theory in some political circles today. We will come back to it later. Now, I want to look at a long run again of historical development of free trade here. Because the actual idea of free trade was first developed around 1817 by David Ricardo, for those who have uh, read their economic history. And it only really kicked in in the UK in 1846, uh, about 30 years later, after the corn laws were repealed, of course, so the UK could import corn from Europe and focus on specializing 
in industrialization, because we were the first country to industrialize. Now initially, as you see there from the picture, in 1846, everyone says, great, let's play snakes and ladders. The UK specializes in industry, Europe specializes in growing food to feed the UK. And that lasted quite a few decades. Everyone copied it across Europe and said, this is a really, really powerful economic theory. We're all getting better off. The problem is, if you look, after 1873, we started to have a global or a European depression, largely because we had oversupply. Agricultural products were flooding out of the US, depressing prices in Europe. And a lot of Europeans were looking around at the UK, which was dominating the global uh, economy and dominating the global politics, and basically said, how comes we haven't got a strong industrial base like them, and we're only growing food to feed them? And they actually started to argue this was a trick in encouraging them to specialize in growing low value added food rather than high value added industrial products. And one by one, European countries started to move back to playing monopoly, trying to protect trade, trying to develop industry behind tariff barriers, and then finding other countries to grow food to sell to them. This is historical fact, even if it's a bit uncomfortable and not generally brought up in economics textbooks. Now the problem is, if you have everybody trying to play monopoly at the same time, it doesn't work. You actually play a different game, and that game is risk. And for those who haven't played risk, basically it's a board game where you try and conquer the world. And lo and behold, those political pressures, as they built up, are exactly what led us incrementally towards World War I. And free trade, of course, completely disappeared into World War I. It then came back again uh, in between, collapsed again World War II. Now, at the moment, we're all shocked, shocked, horrified uh, by the protectionism that's re-emerging in the US under Donald Trump. Obviously, it's pretty outrageous, some of the things he's saying. If we're looking at history again, the interesting thing is the US was firmly protectionist, and I mean really firmly protectionist, all the way until after World War II. Here I've got a list of different US presidents. I don't know if you can see them, hopefully you can. But here's some fantastic quotes that they've all come up with over the years. I'm just gonna run through them all, I'm not gonna read them out. But just take your time and absorb them. My personal highlights are Abraham Lincoln, give us a protective tariff and we'll be the greatest nation on earth. Or thank God, I'm not a free trader. Very Trumpian, all of them. So you can see, actually, the US was very, very much in the camp that I'm describing here now of trying to protect trade, trying to export as much as possible and import as little as possible to become the world-dominating economy that it is today. It's exactly the same technique, of course, that many Asian countries have used, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, that only changed after World War II when there were no competitors, when there was only really the US. And at that point, everything changed, and we entered the world that we understand today but that I would argue is actually starting to come to an end. Now, the world was different after World War II, economically and politically, because we shifted to a world in which the US dollar was key. The commodities that you all sell are priced in US dollars. Global trade is carried out in US dollars. Internationally, everyone thinks primarily in US dollars. Now, how did we get to that stage? We got to that stage because everyone could get US dollars by selling to the US. If you wanted to get dollars, it was easy. You just sold something to the US, which was now open for the first time. Trade was no longer a zero-sum game, as it used to be in the past, when we had to try and get gold off of other people, or silver. You could get dollars very, very easily. Very important point. The problem is, Donald Trump is now showing us that the US appears to be moving back to the pre World War II pattern of thinking about trade. Now, Trump's only one man, but I put it to you, unpopular as he may be in many circles, is there really a constituency in the US that in an election coming up soon could say, let's go back to completely free trade? Let's ignore everything that Trump's just said. Clearly, it's wonderful if we keep importing more and more and more from other people and don't export to them. I would argue no. I don't see that's a realistic political position within the US at the moment. And if we look at the size of the US trade deficit on the left there, and the two countries that are primarily driving it, which is China in blue and Mexico in orange, you can see why Trump is bashing those two countries in particular. Because there's nothing wrong with a trade deficit if you're importing capital goods. 
If you're an emerging market importing capital goods to invest because you're short of them, that's basically like investing in your own education for the future. It's going to pay off. If you're importing consumer goods, every dollar you spend is a dollar you could be spending at home. Now, it may sound controversial, but in certain circumstances, Trump is correct, or his advisors are correct. Trade deficits can reduce employment, and they can reduce income. And even if he's saying it in a very angry, inarticulate way, there is some logic to what Trump is saying. And I don't think politically it's going to be very easy for people to push back against that. So really, when will we see this big shift towards protectionism in the US? Because it hasn't happened yet. We've only had rhetoric. I don't think it's an if. Let's look at what the guys around Trump and Trump himself are saying. We've had Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, saying there's trade, there's sensible trade, and there's dumb trade, and we're going to stop doing dumb trade. I would say they think dumb trade is that, frankly, they just keep buying and don't sell very much. And Trump himself is a businessman. Let's not forget that. And businessmen think, very logically, if you buy more than you sell, you go bankrupt. No business can operate on that basis. Clearly, he thinks the US should operate like a business. It should be selling more than it buys. Or at least its trade should be balanced. And of course, his advisors say the same thing. His policy advisor, Steve Bannon, has openly called himself an economic nationalist. Openly, in several interviews. Um, Peter Navarro, who's guiding Trump on trade, has written a book called Death by China. If you Google it, you can watch it as a movie on YouTube. It's actually surprisingly good viewing. And his US trade representative nominee, Lichtheiser, wrote a very, very comprehensive paper back in 2010 that argues the US should unilaterally derogate China's WTO membership because it cheats on the WTO terms so much. Unilaterally, they should just say, China, we don't consider you're in the WTO. So these are the guys around him, and yet we still have people saying Trump doesn't mean it. I find that very unlikely. Trump's also saying, I want to leverage the vast US market to do bilateral trade deals. Yep, we'll buy from you if you buy from us in equal amounts. That is exactly what China does. So we're going to see a shift where the US starts doing China style trade. And that does represent an absolute leap forward or backwards, depending on how you look at it, in our entire global paradigm. Because here's the risk board beautifully laid out for us. And if the US does step back like those arrows just did, everything starts to change for all of us globally over time. For example, here you can see the TPP. Now, I made myself particularly unpopular. I'm usually unpopular. But I was particularly unpopular when I came down to see clients around 18 months ago, and I said, the TPP will die. I don't understand why everyone's getting so excited about it, and that dog will not hunt. The US is going to kill it. They came up with it. There's no political wind behind it. It's going to die. Well, it has. It has crawled off, unfortunately. So it's exited stage left. And what we're all talking about now, in Australia very much so, from what I read in the press, is a new China-centric Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, the RCEP which always makes me think about Aretha Franklin. Here you can see all the blue countries clustered together. Now, it looks wonderful, doesn't it? It does look wonderful. They really cluster very nicely. The problem is, let me tell you now, it's not going to work. Not going to work at all. Because when you look at a regional grouping, you're presuming that it can start to work the way the EU does, where you have a lot of intra-regional trade and extra-regional trade is at the margin. Well, have a look at the trade balances of all the countries in the RCEP. And again, I want to sing some Aretha Franklin every time I say that. You've got surpluses and deficits. Can you see who's running the enormous surplus there in blue? Any guesses who that is? It's not Australia. It's China. Everybody else is running small surpluses or small deficits. There is nobody in that grouping who is running a deficit big enough to absorb the everything China sells. Nobody. It will not balance out as a group. It may trade more between themselves a little bit, but you are still going to be looking at other people to be buying the end product. And the US is saying, not us, mate. And Europe is looking more and more like it's going to say, not us, mate, either. So really, that worries me a lot. It's not going to balance out. Who's going to absorb that huge surplus from China? 
Now, China's actually got bigger appetite than that. It's talking about the One Belt, One Road, or the new Silk Road project. And here are all the countries that China is talking about building infrastructure to or through to link itself to the rest of the world. Now, that works. In fact, if you're playing Risk, I don't know if anyone ever did in, in their youth, if you play Risk and you get all those countries, you've won. Fantastic. That's a really great grouping of countries. And if you look at what everyone produces or has and offers within that grouping, that can really work. You've got high technology, you've got cheap labor, you've got consumers, uh, you've got a fantastic military in there as well, quite frankly. It really is a very, very powerful grouping that could mean America can exit stage left and just go and trade pretty much with Canada and nobody else. Fine, you're on your own, no worries. Unfortunately, that's not gonna work either. You can see why I'm unpopular. The reason is, what currency are they going to use to trade together? We live in a dollar-denominated economy. I hope I've made that clear already. What you can see here on this chart, this Technicolor chart, is the share of global banking transactions, that's SWIFT transactions, interbank, done in different currencies. Now, the orange ones are in the dollar, and the blue ones are in the euro. Now, the blue ones we can pretty much take out, the dark blue. They're not going to apply to most of that one belt, one road. They're just within the eurozone itself. So look at the orange compared to everything else for the rest of the world. And in particular, look at the little red slice at the top. That's the renminbi. It's irrelevant. Absolutely irrelevant. We hear lots about China trying to internationalize its currency when it's actually reversing at the moment. Over the last 12 months, that offshore holdings of renminbi have dropped significantly after all the interference that China's made in the financial markets. So how are you going to trade within that block if there are you know, fewer and fewer US dollars available? Because this is the key point I'm getting across. If the US doesn't run a big trade deficit, where do the dollars come from? How do you get dollars? How does country A have the dollars to trade with country B within that block? Because dollars will become like gold. There will be the fixed stock that we have now, and when they're gone, they're gone. So global trade will really start to get very gummed up, and financial markets will get extremely volatile if we move in that direction. It's something far too many commentators don't understand, unfortunately. So, just to try and reiterate again, our paradigm really is at the moment similar to a, a picture I remember seeing on The Simpsons years ago of the, the, the food chain being taught in Bart School, which is basically everything going into the human mouth. This is pretty much our global economic food chain. Everybody exports to the US, more or less. And they do that because that's the centerpiece of our post-World War II architecture. The US sends out dollars, it buys from everybody else. Now, that worked really, really well when the US was this big and the global economy was that big. But as everybody else develops and the US basically grows more slowly than China, for example, the ratio gets all out of whack and the US can't run a big enough trade deficit to keep supplying all the dollars everybody needs. We're already seeing that. Japan was a warning in the 80s and the 90s. China really is the harbinger of doom for that particular paradigm. It can't work. But if we don't stick with that paradigm, if we move to a paradigm where the dollar no longer is the global trading currency and nobody knows which currency to use anymore, well, we go back to the 19th century in many ways. We start going back to trade in blocks and people start thinking, who's in my block? Who can I trade with? Who's got things I want? Who can I sell to? Who can I run a trade surplus with to get hold of a currency that I want? All the political tensions come flooding back that we saw in the 19th century and the early 20th century. Pretty worrying. Yeah, I'm a gloomy pom. But unfortunately, that's what history seems to be showing us. So if we look at China and One Belt, One Road, which Australia wants to be part of, this could rewrite the global economic map forever, folks. It absolutely could. It absolutely could, in theory. Or it could see China basically throwing away trillions in infrastructure investments across countries that end up electing their own version of Donald Trump in the future. And we've already seen these headlines recently in the press talking about China's debt diplomacy, where, yeah, they'll lend you money to build infrastructure that suits them very nicely, thank you very much. And then after that, you're in hock to China. And of course, you also have the problem that if China builds all that infrastructure across the One Belt, One Road just to flood everybody else with product the same way that it does the US, all you're going to see is a backlash. One by one, other countries are going to say, 
why don't we have industry anymore? We used to. And you'll get exactly the same pushback that you're seeing in the US, just in time. Now, let's look at the data to see if I'm talking twaddle or this actually makes any sense. If we look here, within parts of One Belt, One Road, what I'm showing you here is the ratio of exports to imports between China and ASEAN, so Southeast Asia. And I'm showing it for various different product segments, from primary commodities in orange, right the way down to high tech or high skill. Can you see them all there? If we're in green, China runs a surplus. And if we're in red, China runs a deficit. Now, if you look at the trend over time, what you can really clearly see is with the rest of the Asian region, China buys commodities and raw materials and food. And everything else, China basically sells back more and more and more. It's running a larger and larger surplus. So in other words, relatively low value added stuff goes in, primary commodities, and high value added products go out the other end. Well, doesn't that look very, very similar to that? And I can assure you, within Asia, below the political level, I have this conversation with clients across the region, and they all nod and say, yep, we can see this. We can see this. One belt, one road looks very, very, very similar to this. And here's a wonderful headline from the South China Morning Post that came out just a few weeks ago. I had to insert because the politicians don't like seeing it, but it's pretty clear. Why talk of a Chinese-led free trade bloc is ill-conceived fantasy. So China recently was at Davos, Xi Jinping talking about uh, globalization, talking about free trade. Wonderful sentiment. Let's see China actually start running a trade deficit. Let's see China actually acting like the US and saying, whatever you provide, we'll buy it. We will be the glue that holds the block together. They don't. They want to sell, not buy. Now, I admit, here you're a very lucky country because they want to buy the food products that you make. So you are a very lucky exception to this rule in general. But you have to be cognizant of how volatile that global backdrop is. So putting it together and thinking about these games again, if the US steps back and starts to play solitaire, and politically that's what we're starting to see, then really the dollar is going to go up, up and up and up. That's the US dollar. And global trade is really going to come under stress and strain. And we'll move from playing snakes and ladders to countries saying, hey, the only way I can get ahead now is monopoly. And if too many countries start to play Monopoly at the same time, well, then we're all going to go back and start playing Risk, which is where things start to get pretty worried. <coughs> and so to put it in a broader context, this may not apply to 2017. I may be exceeding my remit here, and I'm going to be dragged off stage and beaten up in a moment. But everything now is looking happy for Australia. I agree, right now. But what happens if, at some point in the near future, you have to choose? between uh, a Western framework and being a member of One Belt, One Road, one way or another. Because on one hand, you've got a third of your exports, you've got a flood of students, and of course you've got the housing market, which is oh so important, being propped up by a constant flow of China, Chinese money coming in. And on the other hand, you've got cultural links, a few exports, and you've got defense. You've got a US defense umbrella which obviously is a bit of a controversial thing to throw in at the end of an agricultural conference, but, you know, <laughs> let's be realists here. Because at the moment, really, I'm talking about games. There is a giant game being played out, and it's above all of our heads, and it's poker. Very high-stakes poker between the US and China. And previously, it was the Obama regime, and, uh, you know, many people would argue that Obama lost his shirt. Trump certainly thinks that's true. But at the moment, the joker in the pack for all of us is Trump. So let's wait and see what tweet comes through and when, determining what this global framework is going to look like and how we all operate within it. But pretty simply, just to try and bring it down to basic tax at the end of the day, the rules of global trade for all of us are going to remain, first of all, demand. Do people want to buy your product? And the answer is yes. Everybody loves what you guys grow, which is fantastic. Then you've got logistics or supply. Can you get to them in a condition where they want to eat it? different topic that I'm sure you'll be talking about over the next couple of days. But what I'm flagging here is the dirty word that most economists don't want to talk about, politics. Are people going to be allowed to eat it at all? And I do think they will be in Australia's case, but I do think there's still a huge amount of volatility locked away into our current paradigm, which is going to erupt at some point. One tweet will come through, 
and all hell will break loose in the markets. Have a nice day. <laughs> Thank you very much.